I can make this work. So I'm moving it as I want to. There we go. So my name is Ashley Watkins, and I work here with University of Maryland Extension, um, obviously in Garrett County. Uh, some of the things that I work with is the Maryland Master Gardener Program, as well as home horticulture education. So if you have any gardening questions, bug questions, plant ID, that sort of thing, you're welcome to come to the Extension office. Most of our services are free of charge. Uh, so we like to let people know that we can do that. If you need a speaker for like a civic club or an organization or a group or anything like that, uh, Master Gardeners are available to do those presentations as well as myself. So please reach out to us here at Extension. We have a lot of services, not just related to, you know, the 4-H program is very well known, especially this week with the Garrett County Fair happening. Um, but we have, of course, the Master Gardener program, which is pretty well known. We have agriculture services financial services for the financial planning, like educational classes like that, um, food and nutrition, canning classes, all of those sort of things that a lot of people don't always know about our options. So come see us. The other thing I have to tell you is about our Injustice for All uh, posters. So you'll see them, one on the back uh, refrigerator. There's some out front in the office as well. Uh, because the University of Maryland does receive federal funding from the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, we are required to have these posters at every event that we have uh, just to share with people, to share how people can file a claim or, um, you know, a grievance or anything like that. So we do want to make sure that our programming is open for all. And uh, this is just, again, a, a slide uh, to tell you all a little bit more about the Deep Creek Watershed Foundation. They are a nonprofit organization here in the county that was created in order to help um, carry out the Deep Creek Management Plan. Uh, so it's something that is not just specific to Deep Creek Watershed, but to all waters within Garrett County. So again, this is one of their more countywide projects that they wanted to do was the, the rain barrel distribution events. So if you have questions or would like to learn more about some of the other projects that they're doing, um, you feel free to visit their website. It is referenced there at the bottom of this slide and also in your handouts. So to start things off, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background about why it's important to want to use rain barrels. Uh, so the first term that I wanted to share with you all is a watershed. So of course, anytime precipitation falls on the land, the water has to go somewhere, right? So usually it wants to flow to the lowest point on the property. So that's often when we get, <clears throat> you know, water running off and we get gullies and ditches and things like that. Water also is a polar molecule, so it wants to be together. Right, so whenever it falls to the ground, it wants to find more water. Um, that's the, the nature uh, of the molecule. So whenever we talk about watersheds, it's just simply where your water flows. So here in Garrett County, we are pretty different, I guess, than other parts of the state because we live on the Eastern Continental Divide is in our county. So part of our water flows to the Mississippi and part of our water flows to the Potomac, which ends up in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so it's just kind of interesting because most people would live in one state and all their water would flow, you know, one direction, but half of ours flows east and half of ours flows west. So that's kind of interesting. So again, it doesn't really matter where your water flows, whatever is being carried in that water can have a negative or a positive impact. So rain barrels are one way to manage some of this water as it falls to the ground and flows. Okay. So whenever we have a storm event, we call that storm water runoff. So the ultimate goal would be that all water that flows to your property would be contained on your property, right? That would be the ultimate goal, but nobody, I would say very few people are able to, you know, reach that goal. Most of the time it's going to go into, you know, different storm drains, different ditches, you know, all those sort of things. So does anybody know where their water goes? How many people know where they're, you guys know? So they go into storm drains and then you guys know where it goes after that? What's that? I would assume it runs into, I guess, the, the Little Yawk or Cherry Creek from where I live. Okay. 
bring it up so it gets into a bigger water body. Like yeah. as it picks up more friends, more mole water molecules, it's going to, you know, get larger and larger and larger. Okay. So we're not always just concerned about what physical damage that water can do, but it's also what that water is carrying uh, that can be a, a concern. So if we think about um, if we had no buildings or anything like that, what would happen to that water? Um, so these are some slides that came from actually Prince George's County, which is going to be hard for you guys to see, but uh, this top picture up here. So this shows if we had nothing but natural ground cover. As rain falls to the ground, 25% will infiltrate shallowly. Another 25% will infiltrate deep, what we call deep infiltration. 40% would be evaporated and then 10% would run off. So that's the ideal situation. We want a lot of it to be soaking into the ground so that it can help recharge our, our groundwater because that's what the majority of people, especially rural here in Garrett County are gonna get their, their water from, is from the ground, right? They're drinking water. So if we just add like one house, that gives us 10 to 20% of what we call impervious surface. So whenever rain falls and it can't soak into the ground, that means it's impervious, right? It can't soak in. So roof lines, gravel driveways, paved driveways, all of these things, when the water hits it and it can't soak in, it has to run somewhere, right? So with just one house or adding 10 to 20% of this impervious surface, we're really changing the amount that runs off. So we've doubled it. We now have 20% running off. And then if we think about more of like a city situation, we have a lot more water that runs off, right? Or even just small towns, we're getting 30% runoff. And then eventually when we get down here to more of a city situation where we have a lot more paves, a lot more roof lines and that sort of thing, we're getting 50% running off. So it doesn't take long for us to really alter the amount of groundwater recharge capabilities and the amount of, again, st stormwater management that we then have to figure out what to do with. Okay. The other concern is, of course, what is being carried with the stormwater. So it could be pollution. Um, it could also be what physically happens to the ground whenever we get these large rain events. So again, this is supposed to be doom and gloom, right? I don't want everybody to leave here feeling sad. It's just more of a informational session. So by being able to capture some of the storm water in a rain barrel, we can help slow it down and soak it in. That's the ultimate goal of these rain barrels from a watershed perspective. From a homeowner or landowner perspective, it may be that you are interested in using that rainwater, right? maybe for a garden, maybe for washing a vehicle, you know, whatever it may be that you have a goal for that water, that's also helpful to you as homeowners, but also from a perspective of if you're not using that water from a municipal source, so that's less water that has to be traded. It's also less water that's coming out of the ground, right? So if you have a well or a spring, that leaves more in the ground for you to use for potable uses, right? Okay, <clears throat> so there is a change in how a lot of areas are being managed. It used to be that we thought, you know, let all the water run off from these properties and we'll figure out what to do with it later. There's now a change in this management system and we're going to more environmental site design practices. So sometimes you'll see it as ESD in a lot of guidance or literature that you may look at. So the goal with this new environmental site design is that we would treat more of the water that comes off of our own property before it goes away. So again, things like disconnecting your downspouts. So instead of going straight into a storm drain, we're letting them infil infiltrate into our yard, right? Instead of unhooking them and letting them go right onto a paved driveway where it's just going to continue to run and pick up speed, we want to let it go into a rain garden a shallow depression with lots of plants that are gonna help suck up that moisture, right? So the main goal is that making a difference can start at home, you know? So we are giving out 50 rain barrels, right? So that is 50 gallons times 50 that is going to be captured with every rainfall event, potentially captured with every rainfall event here in Garrett County. So we are starting small. 
there is a lot of great guidance. Uh, Pennsylvania State or Penn State has this great stormwater guide. If you're interested, it's a homeowner's guide to stormwater management. If you're interested, you can go on there and download this guide. You can walk through step by step and actually calculate how much stormwater is being generated with one inch of rainfall on your property. Uh, this is our property and it was scary when I sat down and did this. So we were lucky enough to purchase my great great grandparents homestead property. So it came with a lot of outbuildings. We have chicken houses and shops and a barn and all of these things. And on top of I have two large high tunnels like greenhouses that are made of plastic, you know, roof lines. So all of that water runs off as well. So with one inch of rainfall at my house alone, I have over 6,000 gallons of, of rainfall, stormwater runoff. So that's a lot, right? It's a lot to do with, it's a little overwhelming. But again, if you're interested in figuring this out, part of it is also just walking your property and trying to figure out if you have issues, right? Like where is the water running to? Again, it's probably gonna go to a low spot. We also wanna be careful when we talk about these rain barrels of, what's gonna happen after your rain barrel gets full. So once you hook it up, if you cut that downspout, how is that water gonna get back into your original location for the water to then leave your property, right? Because as you can see from a, you know, a regular size house, a small house, even a 1500 square foot house, there's still a lot of extra water that was not gonna be captured in this small rain barrel. Okay, so we're gonna scoot through some of this pretty quick. Um, developing a um, stormwater management plan. There's lots of different parts to it. Rain barrels are just one small part that you can start with, but they're very easy uh, to start with, so they're very attractive. They require very little money to put in, um, and yet it can make a big difference. Okay, this is terrible light, and I'm sorry. Um, some other like micro scale practices that we talk about, so rainwater harvesting with a rain barrel, um, some other things like rain gardens. So this is a picture of a rain garden where you would just excavate out a small portion of a low area on your property, refill it with some like sand and peat and things that are going to be more water absorbent than some of our clays. And, and then you would plant plants that are going to be more likely to suck up the rainwater very quickly. So the goal of a rain garden is not to be a swamp, right? The goal is to have all of that water that went in there evaporated or sucked up within 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, right? It's not just to make a swampy area on your property. Rain gardens. This is one of my favorite slides. I apologize for the yellow. Um, so this is on the left. This would be a lot of our non-native plants that people often use for landscaping versus a lot of our more native species, the plants that have been here since before European settlers came to this country. So as you can see, grasses, drop seed, black-eyed Susans alone, they can go deeper than two feet with their roots. Versus things like daylilies, they go less than a half foot. Kentucky bluegrass, again, less than half a foot, just a couple inches. Fountain grass and hydrangeas, they're all beautiful plants, but we can get a lot more use out of some of our plants by planting some more native plants. Okay, so rain barrels, again, what's the purpose of them? It is to slow down the water and give it a chance to soak in. So we always tell people with a rain barrel, you know, my generation, when I grew up, my grandmother loved to hoard water. She was a water hoarder. She had tons of containers along the outside of her house, not a mosquito net on one of them, you know, and, you know, as kids, we were like, we wanted to play in it, but that was always a no-no because number one, it was gross. We didn't know that, but she did, and she wanted it for like her gardens and all these other things, right? She would even carry it in the house and use it to like wash clothes, and, you know, these old timers were tough women, right, and tough men. They were tough. So, um, Again, the goal is not to hoard the water. It is to let it sit in your barrel. If you know another rain event is coming, you want to let it trickle out slowly, right? You want to keep your barrel empty whenever you know another rain event is coming. So again, don't be a water hoarder, but you want to slow it down for a short period of time and then use it for a designated use that you is going to be helpful to you as a homeowner. Okay, so 
A couple notes about rainwater. So it is non-potable water. So if you're catching this, we can't use it for drinking or cooking or anything like that. No bathing. These are a list in black of some of the things you can use it for, right? Bird baths, vehicles, washing vehicles. You know, um, if, the, if the electric's out, you could use it to flush toilets. Um, there is some special guidance about using it on vegetable gardens. So um, this is New Jersey Extension. They did a lot of studies on the safety from a food safety perspective of using rainwater on harvestable vegetables. So it's a possibility that there could be contaminants within the rainwater. So things that came out of off your roof, if you have raccoons up there and they're going to the bathroom on your roof, wash it down into your rain barrel. You don't want to put that onto your harvestable vegetables, right? So take care if you are concerned about it or if you're planning to use it on your vegetable garden, you might want to take a look at this fact sheet. They found trace amounts, but that doesn't mean, again, every situation is going to be different. So make sure you do your research, okay? The other thing is you could also use it in the spring of the year before anything is ready to harvest. So the goal is you don't want to be putting this rainwater on tomatoes that then you're going to be picking the same day and maybe not washing, right? The other thing is always wash your vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and mm -hmm. that's also a really good guarantee that everything will be good. Okay, just some information on connecting more than one rain barrel. So you can do it through the bottom spigot on these, or you can do it through the top, whichever you prefer. Um, if just a quick note. So if you do it from the bottom, they're going to always have equal amounts. If you do it from the top, the next one won't get any until your first one is full. Um, the other point of interest is that water is heavy. Everyone knows this. It weighs approximately eight pounds per gallon. So if you have 50 to 55 gallons in one location, that could be up to 400 pounds. So where you're putting this needs to be pretty stable. So if that requires you know, some two by fours, some cement blocks, whatever it is to make sure it's a nice level surface because you don't want to take any chances of it falling over, being blowed over, you know, a big black bear knocking it over, right, whatever it may be. You don't want that 50 gallons of water going like along the edge of your house or something like that where it could potentially get into basements or mess up, you know, any type of the construction part of your house. Okay. The other thing is, um, how are you going to access the water? So again, these have one spigot at the bottom. So if you're gonna be trying to get a five gallon bucket under there to get the water out, that could be a problem. You wanna raise it up a little higher uh, before you connect it to your downspout so that you can get a watering can or however you're gonna get it out of there. They're nice spigots, so you can just put a garden hose on it and then you could run your garden hose over to your five gallon bucket or you know, something like that. So things to think about. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, installing the rain barrel, we're going to go outside before you guys take them and kind of look at it a little bit more. But again, you want to be, keep it protected until it gets water in there. You may want to put a brick in the bottom or a rock, something a little bit heavy to keep it in place because um, winds could potentially blow it one way or the other. All right, you also want to avoid putting it close to a foundation, so not closer than 10 feet. Um, and this would be if you're not going to manage the overflow that comes out of the barrel. So if your plan is just to let it run wherever it's going to go, you want to keep it further away from your foundation. Because whenever that rain barrel gets full, a lot of people will put the runoff hose right back down into the downspout where it used to travel. So the rain barrel gets full and then it just continually circulates through the barrel and goes back out. That makes sense. There are also, you know, always you can call Miss Utility if you are going to do any type of digging before you dig. Make sure you call you Miss Utility so you don't hit any electric lines or utility lines. Again, this would be if you're digging to make it level, you know, to put your to put your barrel down. There's also these really cool downspout diverters, which when we did this before, we were able to actually purchase these along with the barrels. So with these, you make one cut in your downspout, you hook your hose up to the side, 
for your rain barrel. Once the rain barrel gets full, it kicks all the water back down that hose and into your rain spout. They're like $15 at any of the local hardware stores. Um, the fancier the diverter is, the more expensive they get. But it kind of makes life a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about going out in the middle of a rainstorm and figuring out what's going to happen with the overflow. So my mom, she has this, it's just a barrel. She likes her rain barrel. And with her, her just her router is she has to go back out and hook back up the rain spout. So there it is, you know, down's poor and she's out there trying to hook her, hook her rain spout back up and it's kind of a pain, but it works for her. Um, so just things to think about. So whenever you cut your, your downspout or your gutter, just have a plan about what's going to happen. Okay. There's also some pretty cool, pretty features like rain chains. Of course, this is a do as I say, not as you see type slide. Okay. We don't want to have any open barrels where it's just going to be a breeding spot for mosquitoes and other troublesome insects. Okay. So you always want to have your containers covered. But your rain chains can kind of replace like a downspout at some time. So you can take your downspout out at the top, put your rain chain right down into your rain barrel, and that'll divert the water a little bit in a more pretty manner, I guess, a more aesthetically pleasing uh, way. Okay, so there's a little bit of maintenance that goes with these. Um, you want to make sure you keep the top screen clean of debris. So if it gets clogged up with anything coming out of your downspout, like pine needles or leaves, it's going to limit the amount of water that can get into your barrel, okay? These barrels are already painted a dark color, so you don't have to worry about that. The darker the color, the less likely algae will grow. You can always put a couple drops of chlorine or, or bleach in your rain barrel as well, unless you're going to wash use that water to like wash clothes or something, right? Um, but it'll help kill anything, keep the algae down and bacteria down, okay? Really important that here in Garrett County, you cannot leave these rain barrels out all year round, right? So mid-October, when we start getting a lot of cold weather, they need to be emptied and turned upside down, preferably taken inside would be best, but turn them upside down so that no water lays in them all winter. Because as it freezes and expands, it could very easily bust your rain barrel, okay? All right, so again, cannot leave them outside fully hooked up. Once you unhook it for the season, you wanna make sure that your downspout is completely reconnected so that the water is going back, traveling the same route it was before you had the, the rain barrel installed. Okay, you paint your barrels, um, instructions on that. Be a good steward of stormwater, right? So remember, whatever you're doing on your property can adversely affect what's happening on a neighbor's property, especially if they're downslope from you, right? We don't want any of that. Um, if you want to build your own barrel, it should be a food grade container. You don't want anything that had antifreeze or oil or anything like that in it. A lot of the pop industry or soda industry has a lot of these barrels from that. So a lot of the big blue barrels comes from the soda industry. Uh, sometimes pickles and that sort of thing, food grade uh, barrels are fairly easy to find. Okay. Building your own barrels if you're interested. Um, you can read through this. There are some really cool pervious surfaces now available. So this is a parking lot where it has this pervious surface. So it's a bunch of rocks that has been gathered together and with a mesh screen around it. So whenever rainfall hits this pervious surface, it goes in instead of running off. So as we realize more damage that comes from stormwater, you know, I guess improperly managed stormwater, there is more things being developed to help us deal with that. Okay. Fertilization, of course, being a good steward of our properties, we don't want to fertilize near waterways at least 25 feet away. This includes winter, don't use things like nitrogen or urea to melt snow that goes directly into our waterways. Okay, and the last thing is I just wanted to tell you guys quickly about WaterWise, which is a property, it's a, it's a way that we can recognize property owners who are doing best management practices, best management conservation landscaping on their properties. So it's a way that you're controlling your stormwater, you're protecting the waterfront. All these different categories 
are ways that you can get points on a yardstick. Once you get 36 inches or 36 points on the yardstick, you can be certified in Garrett County as having a water wise property. So again, these are just, we give them credits in inches because we wanted to look like a yardstick. If anybody's ever heard of Baywise down east, like in a lot of the Eastern counties, it mimics Baywise very closely, but of course we could not call it Baywise here in Garrett County. Okay, so if anybody's interested, I do have yardsticks up here. You can can take a look at them. These are just screenshots from the yardstick and then information on how to get certified if you would want to do that. I will send out a copy of this uh, webinar to everybody that registered. If you'd like to listen to it again, um, you're welcome to do that. Uh, just lastly, without knowledge, action is useless and knowledge without action is futile. futile. So, you know, we want to try to do the right thing, of course, and by managing your water, by helping to manage your water with these rain barrels, hopefully that's one step in the right direction. So this is a list of references that I used for the presentation. And with that, we can, Jess, we can stop the recording there. And does anybody have any questions? 